high standard of living. What does that mean? Who is to say what a high standard of living should be? The precipice we're getting to is everyone, virtually everyone, is going to be in the position of these coal miners. When, when, right. when, we're, when we're talking about, and that, this, that's a good thing. I think most people on the planet know that there's something very wrong with the current socioeconomic tradition. They just don't know how to think about the solution. We are transitioning, whether we like it or not, into a different social paradigm. That's the thing. I mean, that's, a, that, that's the, you know, why can't they figure out that they just want to learn new languages and, and spend more time with their kids and play Frisbee and, and have fun? And just trying to lay out what that is and why it's come to pass. Not that something is good or evil, per se, but just here are the facts. Here's where we're headed down this path. We need a new ethic that, and politics that decouples a person's claim on existence from doing profitable work that someone will pay you for. Because could, a lot of that work is going away. Could I, I mean, we could... Generally, assuming the sanction of society to make such an adaptation, moving from here to there could be done by replacing attributes of the current economy with ones that increasingly orient away from the market's basis in scarcity, competition, and exploitation. Well, but what is the, the zeitgeist movement solution? What are you proposing be done right. uh, uh, to solve the problems? Now, how these changes are to be made is no doubt the ultimate question. Or more accurately, how to arrive at such solutions. And until that is addressed, we're not going to get very far. The resource-based economy, it's not so much that it's a control mechanism, it's an abundance mechanism. There are resources all over the Earth, and therefore we must have a system that can monitor these global resources within a global technological infrastructure. Therefore, we have to have a feedback system, which has to be global in nature, coming from the carrying capacity of the Earth, which is the starting point of all industrial decisions. The first step in this, we do a full survey of the Earth's natural resources. You can't make intelligent decisions if you don't know what comprises the attributes of those decisions. We must first understand the full range and capacity of the earthly components in order to derive inference as to our capabilities. So what do we do? We scan the Earth holistically. Yes, we scan the entire planet, listing all relevant energy locations and potentials. The potentials, of course, to clarify, are based in part on the state of technology. For example, solar technology. Uh, we are seeing a possible exponential increase in this potential where really small solar panels can have up to 97, 98 percent efficiency in the, the radiation that they pull in. So we have this raw data. What do we do? We just rate each resource based on its renewability, pollution, and all the factors that have to do with the act of extraction and everything that goes along with it. It becomes self-defining, based explicitly on the goal of sustainability and maximum efficiency. Given the tremendous power of geothermal, wind, wave, and solar combined, there is again no reason to burn fossil fuels at all. Once we realize this, we move to our third point, distribution and monitoring. Energy distribution and infrastructure projects would logically be formulated based on technological possibility and naturally proximity to sources. In other words, if you have wind energy being utilized in Asia, uh, it's not, not likely going to be delivered to Latin America. So distribution parameters would be self-evident based upon the technology and proximity practicality. Likewise, again, active resource monitoring done through Earth sensors would allow a constant awareness of our rates of use, the rates of depletion, the rates of renewal, or any other parameter relevant to know. This is pivotal for us to maintain what we can consider a balanced load economy. If the scarcity of any resource is going to occur, we will see it far in advance and we can forecast it and we can make proper actions to adjust accordingly before it becomes a very large problem. And just to show that this isn't some bizarre idea that's impossible, Hewlett Packard just recently came out with what amazingly they called a central nervous system for Earth, which the first time I heard that sentence was actually out of the mouth of Jacques Fresco. So they're trying to develop a wireless sensoring system to acquire extremely high resolution seismic data on land. We're creating a high standard of living for all the world's people based on current cultural preferences in fact is now possible within these sustainable boundaries without the destructive need to compete through the market mechanism. It's more like added benefits than the actual drive. The drive is the efficiency and the abundance creation. So the Zeitgeist movement is not promoting an infinite universal abundance of all things which is clearly impossible on a finite planet. Rather it promotes a post-scarcity or abundance worldview with an active recognition of the natural limits of consumption on the planet while seeking equilibrium. And so what the resource-based economy does is take all of our technical innovations that we've developed up to this point 
especially automation, and using those in a way to benefit all people and not just those who copyright, maintain, and hold sway over that particular development. While it is easy to theorize such ideal changes and their merit, transitioning to them smoothly involves many considerations. A natural law resource-based economy is not a utopia. The Zeitgeist Movement seeks a high relative sustainable abundance, relieving the most relevant forms of scarcity. Of course, many who hear such distinctions immediately dismiss such qualifications as mere opinion, right? The fact is, it's not opinion when it comes to life support or empirical human needs. Relative sustainable abundance means seeking more than enough to meet all human needs and beyond while keeping ecological balance. The most relevant forms of scarcity means we differentiate between scarcity as it relates to human needs and scarcity as it relates to human wants, as they are not the same. Unfortunately, market logic pretends that they are, right? The market cannot separate needs from wants. And this gets to the root of the life-blind value system disorder, which continues to distort our culture. The logic goes like this. If there exists any form of scarcity of anything on any level, then we need money in the competitive market to regulate it. Let me explain this a little bit more. One of our international lecture team members, Matt Berkowitz, did a radio interview with a very popular Austrian economist. What the Zeitgeist Movement advocates thus is a shift towards what could be termed sustainable values. In other words, values that are functional as defined by our most updated scientific understandings and thus the laws of nature themselves. So what are human needs? Are they subjective? Human needs have been created by the process of our physical and psychological evolution. And not meeting these virtually empirical needs results, as noted before, in a statistically predictable, destabilizing spectrum of physical, mental, and social disorders. Human wants, on the other hand, are cultural manifestations, which have undergone enormous subjective change over the course of time revealing in truth something of an arbitrary nature. Now this isn't to say neurotic attachments can't be made to wants, so much so that they start to take the role of needs. You want to eliminate, you actually want to eliminate money from society? Oh, excuse me. Yes? I'm trying to find a gentleman doll. It, but it's not, it's not really just eliminating it, it's outgrowing the need for it, just like we're not really anti-capitalist. Me too, me too. Do you have any more in the back? <laughs> Even though, Technically, if you were dropped on an island and just had plenty of food, water, and animals, you wouldn't need money to survive. You could survive. But we can't. You're like saying, we, I, I want to outgrow the need for oxygen. So money isn't necessary to survive. It's not like it's oxygen. Or, you know, outgrow yeah, that's, the need for blood. That's a false analogy. Money, you know, money no. Say? <laughs> these, these guys are looking for a turbo man? A gentleman <laughs> dog, yes. <laughs> You know, money is probably one of the greatest inventions of mankind. And and you're saying I let's get rid you. of it. Now of course now what's so funny? It, yeah, well if we get rid of money, then what are we gonna have a barter system? But how is going back to a barter economy no. gonna further your goal? Where have you guys been? Turbo Man's only the hottest selling Christmas toy ever. <laughs> and when the subject of scarcity came up, this economist responded with not everyone can have a fancy steak or a Ferrari. So this is why I brought up the distinction of scarcity versus abundance. Money is absolutely necessary or it's useful in conditions where scarcity is a reality. Now, like I tried to explain, our technical reality is such that we easily have the ability to produce an abundance of all the world's no, uh, the necessities. But no, life. we don't. So... We can we have an abundance of can we have a of an, an abundance of uh, of of, of uh, Ferraris or Lamborghinis? Can they exist? Can we make enough Lamborghinis so that everybody can have one? Can we make enough That's mega yachts so that everybody can? No, we don't have abundance. We have scarcity. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. This was his definitive view of what scarcity means. Now that may be true. Not every human being can have a 500 room mansion with three jets parked in the front lawn with half the continent of Africa as his or her backyard. With a net worth of over $70 billion, Larry Ellison is the founder of the Oracle Corporation, Atenaires. But it was his purchase of 98% of the entire Hawaiian island of Lanai that really raised eyebrows in 2012. 
You see, in theory, we could conjure up anything and use such luxury-based scarcity defenses to support the existence of the competitive market. The digital revolution would have looked a lot different without the contributions of Bill Gates. Jeff Bezos got his start on Wall Street before founding Amazon.com in 1994 at the dawn of the World Wide Web. I think at a certain point, the, the wealth inequality will be obviously unsustainable. Shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart. But the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than 9 out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind-blowing. I mean, you can't have multiple trillionaires walking around uh, and just moving everywhere with, by, you know, by private jet, living in compounds w with razor wire. What would happen if they knew that the head of Packer Capital was in the car? We know what the anarchists have always said. Otherwise, people are just going to show up at our compounds with, with you know, their AR-15s or their pitchforks and... Yes. Tell me. The urge to destroy is a creative urge. You know, that the society will, will, will not sustain it. So Absolutely. I, I kind of look at these very wealthy people as victims just like the rest oh, of us. Oh, I agree. This is also a hallmark of capitalist thought and forced destruction. Old industries have to be harshly eliminated. New markets have to be forcibly claimed. And old markets have to be re-exploited. I agree, absolutely. I don't demonize any default. I don't demonize really anybody. And then massive levels of unemployment in a society like ours. I mean, at a certain point, we're, we, the richest people will realize that... All right, this is Peter Schiff, and I've come down here to occupy Wall Street to represent the 1% and see if I can have a dialogue with the other 99%, maybe see if we can find some common ground. Enough is enough. We have to spread this wealth because... And maybe I can help educate the people uh, to direct their protests to the more appropriate source, because it's my opinion that they shouldn't be here occupying Wall Street. They should be in Washington occupying Pennsylvania Avenue. They I mean, there we can argue people's, you know, moral compass on a couple different levels, but... Destroy the past, make the future. Should be protesting in front of the White House, in front of the Federal Reserve, in front of Congress. They're all, we're all victims in some, on some level of the culture right. and the world we've been brought into. And you're absolutely right regarding the happiness issue. In front of the Supreme Court. Second chapter of the book, I describe all the research about how people that gain lots of wealth that automatically lose empathy the right. higher they go up right. and become more miserable Mm -hmm. and become more addiction prone because money right. becomes an addiction. Stay. Slim's mansion in Lomas de Chapultepec, Mexico has been his main residence for over 40 years. Knocked down here uh, protesting capitalism. Capitalism is the only solution that they have to their problems. It's not capitalism that has failed them, it's socialism. And in other words, it's open source, not just open source information, but open source technology and open source access. I hate to be cliche here, but we have the icon of the Trump presidency yeah. and the, all the values that clearly he puts forward, winning, right. you know, a complete lack of empathy, you know, right. and, and rewardingly so, like they, he appreciates that he doesn't care. Yeah. And that, that kind of embodies, I think, the, the psychology, the social psychology that we, we have as not only a culture, but definitely pollutes the wealthy more than anybody else, which is really troubling because it's obviously the wealthy that have the lobbying power. It's obviously the wealthy that have been in control of government, right. not just in this modern period, but throughout history, going all the way back to monarchs, those that have the most resources and are by nature the most indifferent. Nature meaning they've there's something about this arc, the more power and money you have, specifically money. Exactly. Leading. Yeah. So we're kind of screwed in that sense. Really wrong. First, I employ, I employ 150 people. Oh, I employ 150 people, right? I've created those jobs. How many jobs did you create? How many people did you employ? How much money have I given you? You're not just spouting some bullshit no, no. here. There are studies showing that the more wealth someone has, the less able they are to perceive pain in someone else's face. Did you see that study? Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. precise. No, it's in the book too. But what you're forgetting is if I make a hundred million, I had to create a lot of jobs to make that money. That's the point. When the capitalist no, is see, making there's a money thing called greed. We're stuck in the power system. And the problem with 
But we're all, we're all greedy. Everybody. No, no, we're not. Well, you cannot uh, say that we're all greedy. Uh, you uh, cannot. Well, you, don't you don't you want things greedy. for yourself? You don't want more. You don't want better things for yourself. That's fundamentally indifferent by this kind of determinism that's right. happened. Uh, we can. You could speculate on the deeper causes of that as is Well, that's that. where I'm trying to go. The uh -huh. determinism that you're referring to is it's because we're so accustomed to thinking of it. I'm thinking the 1% and versus the 99%. Sure. And my feeling is like... Well, some of us are simple people. We just want a place to live. We just want some food in our refrigerator. And it's no it's all it's a hundred percent against this system exactly. whether we call it uh corporations or we call it uh, you know institutions or we call it the, the sort of the mega organism or whatever it is and capitalism and capital capitalism is the best way to get those things whose agenda is against ours and the difference between the one per, the one percent are like the the answer to that question is not who it is what. And what determines our standard of living is the current state of technology in many ways. And what is required to keep, of course, social and environmental sustainability on a finite planet. That's basically the equation. If we as a society wish to keep the value of constant materialism, growth, and consumption, promoting the virtue of having infinite wants, then we might as well just kill ourselves right now as that is going to be the end result if we continue to push past the limits of the physical world with respect to our resource exploitation and the loss of biodiversity. So I want to make it very clear, this new economic proposal isn't just about seeing how the market is obsolete per se, given our new pow powerful awarenesses of technical efficiency, it is also about the fact that we need to get out of the market paradigm as fast as we can before it causes even more damage. No one actually knows how to effectively shovel resources from the minority that, that controls almost everything to the majority that has almost nothing in any consistent way. DMAS is about learning to apply these principles of mimicking the way nature solves problems and applying them to all aspects of our lives. This on some level is possible, if we don't destroy ourselves in the interim, imagine we accomplish this. In order to reduce the total amount of mass that is invested in producing the wealth and the progress that we all want, and to being able to take care of ourselves and the entire population of the planet on a sustainable basis.